get into how can they continue to pay clinicians more with inflation. Like, there's almost no way for them to be able to. Welcome to the Two Cent Dad podcast, where we interview dads to discuss their journeys of intentional fatherhood while doing work they care about and living a life of purpose. I'm your host, Mike Sudik. Good morning. I am excited about today's episode. It's not every day you get to talk with a 10x Ironman. I'm Chris Betcher. He's a father, 10x Ironman, ex-physical therapist, now doing the Lord's work, coaching men to to doing some amazing physical feats, but also um, spiritually. And I'm excited to have you on, Chris. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, Mike. It's uh, it's great to be able to connect with you again this morning and uh, looking forward to our conversation today. Yeah, man. Well, Chris um, is a really cool guy. I met him uh, via Twitter, and we have a special relationship because I signed up for Ironman uh, 70.3, which is a half Ironman in Waco, which I'm doing. I probably will have done this after the, the episode is, is live. It's next week. Um, but you were um, very instrumental in just helping me in early training stuff, and, and I really appreciate that. So that's how I met Chris, and we started talking about some of the work he's doing and, and all of the training he's done and just, I just want to hear. So I, I feel like there's so much I want to talk to you about, Chris, and ask you. So <laughs> I'm trying to just struggling where to start. Um, but I wanted to start out by um, when I was a kid, I remember I was like really young. I remember watching on TV, the world championships in Kona and seeing these people doing Ironman and just thinking they're absolutely crazy for one. And then for two, thinking about how the heck, could you ever do this? Like, it was like a full-time job to train for these races. Like, it's just, it's bananas. And um, it's wild to think I'm doing half of that race. But then to think about you having done it 10 times, I wanted to hear about just how did you get into doing Ironmans initially? Like, tell me about that journey. Like, did you just wake up one day and you're like, I'm going to do an Ironman and then you start training for it or what? Uh, I would say part of it was being very naive and probably thought so i had just uh, finished racing collegiately track and field for a couple of years and uh, a buddy of mine was like we should get bikes and i I had a six month gap between finishing up undergrad and starting pt school and uh, so we kind of jumped into it and we were had a position where we both worked doing some bartending stuff at night and so we had basically the entire day to just ride our bikes and train and just, you know, be foolish 22-year-olds. And then he had a friend who had just raced Ironman Wisconsin the year before and had signed up for Ironman Louisville. And so we basically got peer pressured into doing it. We, we had done, I will say, we had done a sprint triathlon, uh, and maybe an Olympic distance one the year before, but just barely tipped our toes into it. I mean, the amount of training that those two require versus the full uh, I, I had no idea the difference, and so we signed up and um, had, like I said, about four months to be able to prepare ourselves. Three of us went down there, and uh, you know, I I was able to. I didn't really have any expectations, and I think that was a, a good thing for my first one because I really didn't know what I didn't know. I just knew I needed to make sure I could finish, and. Uh, Put together a, a solid race and finished sixth in my age group. And a, a, one of the guys that came down, he had finished fourth. And if, wow. if you know anything about Ironman, they have a, a set number of slots available for each age group. And so well, there was three spots available. So a friend of mine, I, it wasn't even on my radar of like going to Cohen or anything like that. Well, we go to Monday morning after the race. They always have the um, basically where everybody secures their slots. So the guy that finished fourth, a friend of mine, we, we went over there together, uh, had some breakfast, and then they started going through and got to our age group. And two of the top three guys already had secured spots. So it rolled to four. So he got his spot. The fifth place guy wasn't there. So it rolled to me at six. And there I was. <laughs> um, and, I, and I had put together a, a fair race. I went just over 10 and a half hours. But like, didn't really have any expectations with it at all. And so there I was trying to figure out how I was going to get to Hawaii because the race, it was the last qualifier (laughs) for that year. And I had six weeks to figure out how to get from Louisville, Kentucky, just finishing, you know, didn't really have a lot of funds to how am I going to make this work to go, you know, race something that 
I may never get the opportunity for again. So, yeah, that's uh, a, some luck and a whole lot of just being a naive young kid. That's amazing. So then tell me tell me the story about Hawaii then. Did you did you end up then going, right? I mean, tell me about that. Yeah, so basically the, uh, the friend of mine, uh, Tom, who was – uh, finished fourth. Him and I went out there together. There was one other guy that went out there with us that was just going to sort of be our, our cheerleader, kind of our, our guy that was going to help us kind of move uh, move things around. And the three of us just had a blast. Again, no expectations, just kind of went out there and uh, just took it all in, you know, everything from uh, Ironman Village to they, they, do this, they do this race. It's not even a race. It's like a one-mile little fun run. It's called the Underwear Run. And so it's literally like all these triathletes, all these spectators that just come in two or three days before and you do this one mile underwear run. And so we, we did everything that we could and just, you know, it was just being able to like have conversations with some of the pro athletes and, you know, you're going to all these little dinners and things like that. And so you're just, to me, there's very few opportunities in sports for the amateur athlete to be so up close and personal with, you know, the best in the world and, you know, in my opinion, what these guys are able to do and the amount that they push their bodies is, is like on the next level compared to even, you know, the athletes that are paid, you know, millions and millions of dollars. Uh, these, these pro athletes, you know, some of them barely, barely can uh, provide for their families, but they're out there just doing everything that they can. So I, I just I have so much respect for, for those guys and uh, just their willingness to have conversations with, you know, guys like me who are just kind of getting started in the sports and, just had, had so many questions and uh, so many things I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so then you, so then you obviously got the bug, right? You know, and and kept kept going after it with the Ironman stuff, and you did that for a season, right? And um, meanwhile, you're a, you're a physical therapist at the time, right? Yeah. So I I took let's see I finished up in um, that race was in October of that year. I started graduate school in January and continued to train. Did, did some other small races, uh, and then in the middle of my PT um, education, I did race one more time uh, as far as like a full distance event, um, but uh, kind of, actually that was the only race I've ever like completely blown up, was able to finish, but uh, it was it was ugly, and part yeah. of that again was I had this expectation that now I needed to qualify, and so that, that put a little bit extra pressure in, just, you know, I think I was 23, 24 at that time, and just realized that like, I can't go in with a time expectation. I need to, from this point on, I need to race the day. I need to race myself as opposed to worrying about what everybody else is doing. So that, that was a really good lesson for me to learn early on uh, after having some early success. Uh, and that allowed me to just continue to focus on myself. And as I got into the early stages of my PT career, uh, I raced, I think I did six, six or seven more over the course of the next four years and uh, was able to, you know, really kind of take it to the next level and uh, get back out there a couple more times and just, um, yeah, just I felt like uh, after I, I I got married in 2015 and um, was able to go back out there with my wife and uh, after doing that it was it sort of was I don't want to say the final chapter at, at that phase of my life of I didn't really feel like I had a whole lot else to prove I knew I wasn't going to be able to you know, go to the pro level and actually, you know, provide for my family with, with Ironman. So uh, it was the amount of time and energy that I was pouring into it. Uh, I felt like in some ways I was stealing from my wife. And so I just decided at that point to kind of close the chapter. And um, at, at this point, you know, it's been seven years since I've raced uh, that distance. And so who knows? I, I, I still would love to get back into it. I, I've Floated around with the idea of maybe starting up again next year, uh, and it's really for the kind of the purpose of I want my kids to see me race. I think that's very important, and that's why I know you know you're mm -hmm. you're pushing yourself, and you know something with you going down to Waco next week, having your whole family around. Uh, I mean, that just kind of gives me chills thinking about watch having my kids see me cross the finish line. So, yeah, man, no, that's that's awesome. I think that the balance there though is really essential because it's like you. You recognize that hey this is taking away from maybe my relationship with my wife and then then with your kids and but at the same time you don't want to fully pull out of those things that are your that are pushing you to be better also modeling that to your kids I mean 
there's a there's a balance there that I think is really important. Um, you know, I, I, and you kind of recognize that, right? So you're kind of in between that, you know, because I, I see that same thing with some guys that that are either big into like Ironman or or bodybuilding or whatever, and it's like they're doing that at the detriment of the relationship with their with their kids, right? It's like it's like self improvement only goes so far if you're if you're if you're subtracting from the relationship that you're in, you know, especially your kids and your spouse and and I think that's something I'm really cognizant of, and I know that you're really in tune with. And it, I think it flows into some of the coaching that you're doing with guys with Ironman training and, and some other of these retreats that you're doing with, with your brother, Brett, you know. So can you talk about that and kind of what you've seen? Maybe we're kind of skipping ahead a little bit but because I want to hear about your journey with, you know, um, being a PT and then now kind of what you're doing now. But um, tell me a little bit about maybe how you kind of made that transition or what you're seeing and then what you've seen with some of the guys that you've been working with. Sure. Yeah, I think you hit that hit the nail on the head when you talked about finding balance. Because at the time, I felt like I was stepping away from Iron Man for the right reasons, but unfortunately, it did leave a major gap in my life. And I realized very quickly that that was my passion, and that it was it was keeping me from recognizing some of the other things in my life that were very frustrating for me. Uh, you know, things like student debt, things like just the brokenness of the healthcare system and just not feeling like this is really where I belong. Uh, and unfortunately what that did was, or what that it just left this huge hole in my life where uh, my shift then went to, okay, I've got this debt, I've got this broken career. I don't really have any other skills outside of physical therapy, or at least that's what I told myself. Mm -hmm. And so then all of my time and energy was kind of poured into the financial side of it. How can I be, you know, the best provider, best provider, get out of debt, uh, and I just, I just, it, it consumed me. You know, I, I, I did do a lot of self-education on the financial side of it, which I do think was necessary because my education didn't prepare me for that. So it, it was, it was a necessity, but then it became almost compulsive for me, where it was just like all I wanted to do was listen to financial podcasts. And, follow the markets, and it, it was just the, the rat race uh, over and over again. And it unfortunately took me several years to really do something about it. Uh, and, and so then kind of going back to what you were talking about earlier, I think this happens a lot with guys when it comes to their health as well, because we're, let's say we're a college athlete, high school athlete. You know, uh, I, a good friend of mine, Jordan Goldstein, talks about this stuff all the time. But he, he basically, we, we have a purpose for our bodies. And that purpose is, you know, you could call it a conquest, you call it an adventure, whatever it is. But when we're competing against each other and trying to push ourselves to the next level, it gives our bodies purpose. And all of a sudden, when our sports competitions are removed and we go through this transition of life into having other responsibilities as a provider, either provider for our family or dad, husband, all these different things that are pulling us in different directions, and we have no purpose for our bodies because our competition has been removed, now we just kind of fall off the tracks, and it can be very easy for us to all of a sudden just focus on money and just chasing the almighty dollar over and over again. And uh, so it's, it's something that, you know, with our men's groups and with even when it comes to health, for some people, they just they need to put something on the calendar, you know, whether that's a mm. half Ironman or a 5K or, you know, getting into some other kind of, of competition. Uh, it at least allows us to kind of focus that energy into a, a goal and a pursuit of something so that we can have something to strive for as men. Uh, I think it's, it's part of its comfort. You know, we're just used to being comfortable, and uh, it's really hard to break free from that when you don't really have anything to chase. But I just believe we all we all need a little something to chase on the physical side to uh, to be the best versions of ourselves. I could not agree more with that sentiment. I think that is definitely how I felt about the whole Ironman thing and signing up for it. It was like I'm not one to just go work out to work out. Like I have buddies that be like, oh, we just go to the gym, you know, three times a week and we just lift a little bit or whatever. It's like that's great and I understand that, but it's like. I need something on the calendar, you know, I need, and, and I think what I found with the group that's doing Waco is like, you kind of are like, all these other guys are training. Yeah. I've never actually met any of them in real life, like in person, you know, until I'm not going to meet until next week. And it's like, 
but at the same time I knew they were all kind of scared about this goal. Like it was, it was a stretch goal for all of them, you know, and it's like, Hey, we're all pushing ourselves to this thing. And it, yeah, there's just, it's, it's a unique thing. I think you, you hit the nail on the head. It's like, as men, I think having, having the competition, cause it's like, I'm not competing with those guys, but I kind of am, you know, it's kind of like, I don't want to show up there and be like way behind, you know, it's like, I want to put in the work so I can be do, you know, I want to, I want to do well, you know, I'm not racing them and racing myself, but kind of like, you, you need that. And if you don't have that, I think it's a very unhealthy thing, you know, mentally and physically, obviously. Yeah. And it, it's, we become kind of our own worst enemy, uh, whether that's because of isolation or lack of self-belief, but I think those things just can take us down a very dangerous road. Uh, and that ultimately takes away from, you know, it's, it's not really a selfish thing to our, to us, like we don't look at it as like I'm isolating myself because I'm being selfish. I don't believe in myself because I'm selfish, but it becomes it becomes that because it's stealing from our families and it's stealing from our kids, and uh, it's it's one of those things that um, I didn't realize it for as I mentioned a long time. But you, for me, COVID allowed me to reflect on a lot of these things and realize that like I was not putting my best foot forward. I was going through the motions, and I use the word numb a lot. I just felt numb, like I was. I was doing things. I was trying the best that I could in the moment, but I I didn't really have I didn't really have a passion for life, and that yeah that just I, I you know our daughter I think like the first year and a half of her life it just um, it's it's time I'll never get back, and I'm, I'm glad I recognized it when I did. But it, you know, being a new dad, it was hard enough in itself. But then when you just feel like you're completely going through the motions. Uh, it's yeah, it's, it's not, not something I want to ever experience again. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I'm with you on that. I mean, I think I've had seasons of that and the becoming your worst enemy. You say that that's, that's an interesting way to put it. Um, I, I, I don't, maybe you can expand on that, but what, where my mind went with that is like, it, it really centers around like self-talk and like how you're viewing your own, you know, your own self-worth, right. You know, you're like, and I think when you audit that and you realize that you're you're not in a good spot in, in the way that you're talking to yourself, you know, I think I read somewhere it's kind of like if you if you talk to your spouse the way you talk to yourself, like it probably wouldn't end well. And it's like, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, I, I probably do that a lot worse than <laughs> than I would like. Um, and I think that, you know, becoming your own worst enemy is, is a good way to put it. I'd like to I'd like to Chris to to pry in a little bit to kind of the spiritual side of things, you know, if you could share a little bit, um, I know the thread you just shared the other day about just this journey of the last, what, you know, year and a half or so from COVID to now and, you know, leaving your, you know, maybe thinking about leaving your job, then you got fired and it was kind of a wake up call and you're like, okay, I got to act on all these things that I've been kind of working towards. Tell me a little bit about kind of what, what you feel like God was doing in your life and kind of where that's at and, and how that relates to some of the work you're doing with these retreats and, and what you're seeing in, in the lives of men um, that are making some of these changes. Yeah. So <laughs> we're going to jump deep, trying, Chris. So. No, you're fine. You're <laughs> just, good. Just like that. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's, that's fine. I'm just trying to figure out where to start with it here. So I guess I'll, I'll go back to kind of that level of brokenness that I was kind of experiencing in my life and just the opportunity to reflect and realize that, it really did come down to to me and the decisions that I was making on a daily basis to determine where I was going forward with it. So, you know, I started to understand some of the, the brokenness of this world, whether it's education systems or healthcare systems. And it was like, it'd be really easy to just complain about these things. And I did that for a long time. But at, at some point, I just needed to do something about it. And for me, that just meant I needed to focus on myself because I can't reinvent these things and, and you know, snap my fingers and, and create a solution to it. But thank you for listening to the two cent dad podcast. I wanted to take just one minute to tell you how this show is possible. And that is through my business EC group. We help software companies get more done by building them amazing developer teams. Now those teams come alongside their in-house developers to help them build more and build faster. We are a purpose-driven company, which means that we use our profits to help support nonprofit work in the locations that we operate. We operate in the U.S., in Michigan, and also in Chennai, India. 
You can check us out at teamwithec.com. Again, that's teamwithec.com. So if you're hiring software developers or you know someone that's hiring software developers, check us out. Love to talk to you. I can have a small impact in my circle and whether that's just to get people to think a little bit differently or to challenge themselves on a health level so that they aren't dependent on a healthcare system. But what it, I think the first step for me was understanding that I wasn't alone. And uh, like the thread I talked about yesterday was how, for me, tribe is everything. And that's why now I'm, I'm so big on you know building brotherhood and building tribe. Because on our own, our own, you know, you talked about self-talk. We, we put ourselves in kind of a prison and we feel like we're completely isolated from the world. And that just keeps us from moving forward. And it really wasn't until, you know, my brother and I decided, okay, we're going to, we're going to start this podcast with really no idea of what we're doing besides just trying to have conversations. And at first it served as just kind of a sounding board for him and I to get our thoughts out. And, you know, we share very similar beliefs. And even though he's my, he's my brother, it was another person to just like understand that like, we're not alone. We're not crazy. And there are things that are broken, but like, let's get down to the roots of these things and figure out, you know, how, how can people make an impact in their own individual lives that they may not even be aware of because for whatever reason, the media or, who, you know, different entities are not giving them the correct information or they're giving them too much information that they can't really sort through. So we just started talking about things and then slowly but surely felt confidence in what we were doing. I would say... I would have told you, you know, a year ago that I, I was terrified of just getting in front of this microphone and mm-hmm. uh, it, it felt extremely uncomfortable. It felt way out of my comfort zone and I just needed to keep showing up and doing it. And I think that was God just preparing me for something else. And I had, I don't think either one of us would have told you we planned on being podcasters long term or anything like that. It was, it was something that it was a season that we needed to go through to prepare us for something. And as we gained confidence, then we started to just reach out to people that, you know, we admired what they were doing and we just wanted to have conversations with them. And that just kind of fueled us. And, you know, we were learning from them and we were getting to understand their experiences. But more than anything, it just built up uh, our network and our belief that these people want to do something big just like we do. And there's no reason that, you know, where they started from and where we're starting from, you know, we can, we can accomplish something very similar and maybe we can come alongside each other and help each other in the process. And, you know, all of these different conversations just continue to add up. And by the time I got to January, you know, I, I felt a lot more confident in myself. And, uh, you know, for me, that was when I almost lost my job because I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take the jab and, uh, you know, eventually was able to get the religious exemption, but that was, That was probably the turning point for me that said, like, okay, like, it's game on. Like, I am not going to allow somebody to dictate my ability to provide for my family. Mm -hmm. And when I realized that, like, this isn't about health anymore, but this is about something much bigger. And, you know, we need to we need to kind of prepare ourselves to take personal responsibility in as many areas of our life as we can. So, you know, the next few months, it was continuing to just have these amazing conversations and develop more and more self-belief and our ability to do something else. And as we found this tribe, you know, guys like you and Boyd and and all these different guys that I was able to network with, I realized that this is extremely powerful. And if I feel like I didn't have this a year ago, there has to be a whole bunch of other guys that feel exactly the same way. And so then it was, it was like, okay, how do we start organizing this? How do we start, you know, figuring out the best way to, to help guys, you know, take back their health, build community, and uh, and just be able to have have relationships and have a, a foundation in their health that they can, you know, take advantage of the rest of their life through you know all kinds of, of life you know, challenges that are going to come our way. So then, yeah, then uh, end of May rolled around. Uh, I was feeling very confident with the direction that things were going, but um, you know, God had His way of kind of <laughs> playing a playing a, a different card and uh, I, I lost my job. And uh, so then at that point, uh, I told myself like, I will never go back to traditional healthcare. 
I don't care if I have to, you know, get to the point where I'm, you talked, talked about a 401k earlier, like clear out of, you know, I need to clear out my 401k to invest in myself right now. Like that's what I'm willing to do because mm-hmm. I just, I can't imagine sitting on my hands going back to doing something that I know is going to make me feel the same way when I think there's an opportunity here for something so much more. So really the last few months has just been, you know, continuing to, to build and network and um, understand a whole lot of areas of, of business that I had very little exposure to uh, going through school. And so, yeah, we're just continuing to, uh, to build and um, try, to, try to create a, I would say, something that maybe not competition so much for healthcare, but more of an alternative. That, like, mm-hmm. you know, if, if you really want to avoid this broken system and, and build community with, with guys who are trying to create something else, you know, it's really about let's take advantage of, of creating health habits for you right now and having people come alongside you to help you with that so that maybe when you're 50, 60, 70 years old, you're not dependent on what I believe is going to be an even more broken system over the next, you know, 15, 20 years. Yeah. There's a lot of different directions we could take the conversation now, but I think it's exciting to me to see the the whole COVID, um, I don't know what a word to describe it, debacle, um, that, you know, huge, the whole thing that happened with COVID was kind of a wheat from the chaff kind of moment, you know, where you had people that on the spiritual side either got closer to God and or didn't, you know, just kind of were like, they were lukewarm, so they just were like, whatever, you know, like whether that was you know, attending church or whatever. But then on the physical side, it's like some people just leaned into their vices. And then some people were like, no, I'm going to make a change and use it as an opportunity to better themselves. And I think that that's really cool to see like such a, such a scenario play out where it's a disruption event, right? It's either it's, and and it's going to, when you emerge from it, you're going to be better in certain ways. Like I think the people that leaned into a deeper relationship with God are are at a better spot now. The people that are now lean into health, you know, bettering themselves health wise, I think like you, they're like, they can kind of, kind of take a step back and they're like, wait a second, this whole system is kind of questionable, right? And 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 you're like, they're forcing this and they, it's like, this doesn't add up. And so all these things that I was thinking about. So it, I think that's really cool to see. And I think you're, you're, a, you're a piece of this new era, I think, of, of healthcare that is, that I think is coming in, you know, I, I don't know what you see, but it's like, if you look 10, 20 years down the road, it's like, I don't think our traditional healthcare system is going to look the same. I think it's ripe for disruption. It's bloated. It's got a bunch of bureaucracy. It's controlled by big pharma. It's like, you have all this stuff that's making it ripe for disruption. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what's going to emerge out of it because I think there's so many dollars that's flowing into this old system that it's like, as you, as you have like the Chris's of the world or like these other like alternative places that can achieve a much better result at much lower, you know, price. I think people are going to start to change that buying behavior. Sorry. I feel like that was kind of a little bit all over the place there, but I, I'm, it's something I'm real excited about. And I think it's It's going to play out. It's going to be a huge disruption to the status quo in terms of healthcare. Yeah. Uh, so what you touched on earlier, as far as I think people kind of had a fork in the road of which direction they took with this. And I think those of us that use this as an opportunity to kind of level up and think more critically, uh, obviously we're gonna go in a direction that should lead our families and our communities in a positive direction. But then I think it also serves as, we're gonna be able to serve as kind of a beacon for those that went the other way and hopefully help to steer them back. And I'm not sitting here and saying, I've got it all figured out because that's far from the truth. But I do, I do believe that the direction of my life is moving in a much more positive direction than if I would have went the other the other way. And yeah. I think if we can continue to, you know, grow together, those of us that are, are trying to level up and, and make the most of these opportunities, uh, people are going to start eventually asking questions. Even if they went the other the other way, they're going to realize that this is not working, and there has to be an alternative. What these guys have over here. Like, I want that. I want to be a part of that. And I, it, it just creates – that energy is contagious as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I, I saw that when um, we went out to – my brother and I went out to Zach Hummel's Do Hard Things conference. And when you put 50 or 60 people in a room that have 
uh, the best interests of each other in that room, and there's not a lot of ego, and there's and there's just genuine positivity and a willingness to like actually want to get to know these people. It's something that like you can't. I can't even like put it into words because it's not something I've really experienced in my life to have that many people that genuinely care about each other. But I, I think there's just there's going to be so much opportunity to to see what we can do when we show an alternative that is obviously bearing fruits in our life. And uh, you know I think that's just that's just God's work right there of like showing people the way to uh, to, to just be more positive, more grateful, um, just trusting in, in, in our faith and all these different things that uh, I believe, you know, create a, a more uh, impactful life and just a, a more positive life um, on this earth. So, uh, and then kind of going to the, the healthcare side of it, there's certainly going to be an opportunity. Uh, I just, you know, you look at Medicare and Medicaid are, are virtually insolvent. They're stealing from future years uh, payments and all these different things that they're doing right now. And, you know, you, you get into how can they continue to pay clinicians more with inflation? Like, there's almost no way for them to be able to continue to, to raise what they're paying these guys because they just don't have the funds for it. They're actually cutting reimbursement for Medicare and Medicaid, and they're creating more documentation for clinicians. And so you're, you're spending more time doing documentation than you are patient care, so the patient care continues to decline. And, and I could go on and on as far as, Issues that I'm continuing to see that I, I don't believe translate into better health care. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think more and more uh, clinician burnout. And that that could actually be the kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back because you're going to, you could potentially see huge shortages. And like, let's say, you know, my parents were both doctors. You see this a lot where, you know, generations of doctors and all of a sudden mom and dad are like, you don't want to go to med school. Like the system's yeah. broken. And so all of a sudden you get this this huge wave of, of people that don't want to go into healthcare and you're just left with this this massive shortage. And uh, as you as you get this rising population of baby boomers that are gonna need more and more health care. So yeah, I'm not trying to be doom and gloom about the system, but I do think an alternative and those those people that are willing to think outside the box and help people earlier on more of like a preventative side. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that's always been my biggest issue with healthcare is it's, it's so reactionary. Uh, it's just Band-Aid solutions and anything that uh, I think it all goes back to profits. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to profit from something that's preventative uh, versus something that when you have a serious problem, you can sell them whatever you want for whatever, for whatever amount you choose kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, so getting just getting people to think about preventative medicine and taking their health more seriously. And uh, I do believe COVID is going to show that that's, you know, that's going to help us. It's going to help us to, to show kind of peel back the curtain of uh, how broken the system is and uh, hopefully have people make some more decisions to, to take advantage of getting their health in order in their 20s, 30s, and 40s instead of waiting until – you know, they've got diabetes and heart disease when they're 65. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think, and I think you guys are, you guys are part of that, you and, and Brad, and, and obviously you're collaborating with other guys um, like Boyd to do these events, to do training, to do co- coaching, consulting. I mean, that is part of the grassroots effort, in my opinion, to, to kind of answer that, right? It's the proactive approach. And I think it's interesting to think about the economics of how does that, how does that, how does that catch up or calibrate to like, so right now you pay all these premiums and then they go into this big system and then you pay all these huge fees to the doctors. It's like, if those dollars flowed more into preventative, into the preventative side, it's only actually a sliver of probably the amount that you would, that you need for the current system. Right. But the incentives aren't aligned for one. And then for two, like how do you have companies that come behind that and say, Hey, we're going to fund these initiatives because they're a big, you know, employers are a big part of, you know, what they're paying these, some of these premiums and some of these things. So, no, I think it's, I think it's really interesting. So, um, so tell us about Chris, how, how do people get in touch with you and kind of just what, what, what's on the horizon for you and Brett and some of these events that you're doing? Um, can you talk about that? Kind of give, give a little pitch on, on kind of what you're up to and how someone can get in touch with you or work with you and what that would look like. Yeah, sure. So uh, we're actually right now organizing our, our next men's group, 
we've got one started here in about three weeks. So if you're having a, a tough time right now uh, finding community and you know, you know you need to take action, but you're not really sure what that looks like, um, our groups are designed uh, for, we, we meet via Zoom, and then we have our, our regular uh, chat that we put together goals and challenges and just build that community through our, our Telegram chat and uh, we kind of go into different topics each week, talk about things like nutrition, fitness, finances, uh, just all these different things when it comes to relationships that as men, you know, we may, we may have a hard time having conversation locally, you know, we're maybe not on the same wavelength with people or they're just not ready to have those tough conversations. So it's been amazing to us to see what happens when like-minded men come together uh, and are willing to take action and are, are looking for input and are also willing to, in some ways, be vulnerable, you know, being able to, to share some things that they may not otherwise have, have told, you know, their spouse or their best friend at work, things like that. And so we're seeing a lot of life change there. Guys are, are doing some pretty amazing things. So if you're looking for community, uh, reach out. I'm available by DM for that. Um, and then also when it comes to health, you know, my brother and I are, are working, doing two-on-one program with individuals right now. You know, if you're looking to lose some weight, uh, we talk a lot about insulin resistance, which I believe is at the heart of almost all chronic disease that we see right now. Getting people to understand what that is, how that makes them feel. You know, even when you're in your 20s and 30s, things like brain fog and always being tired and, and all these, these things that we just attribute to life and stress when in actuality it has a lot more to do with what we're putting into our bodies and the slow increase in insulin resistance that's taking place. So being able to just develop health habits for long-term success, uh, laying that foundation early on. Part of it, of course, is weight loss. Everybody wants to lose weight, and we're, we're comfortable being able to, to take care of that. But most importantly, it's how do we make you a better dad? How do we make you a better husband so you can run around with your kids? We, I always joke around, like, my goal is to be able to run around with my great-grandkids. Like, that's, yes. that's sort of my... Uh, my pinnacle is if I get to 85, 90, and I'm, I'm still out in the backyard, like, I made it. <laughs> yes, so, I agree. Um, I'm, I'm on 100% 100% same page. <laughs> uh, and then uh, finally, yeah, Boyd and I are going to be uh, putting together some things here over the next uh, couple of months. We're planning on a couple of, of training camps uh, specific for, for triathlon uh, in April and May out in the southeast. And from there... Um, you know, it, it, that can be for anybody. If you're just a runner and you're looking to build community with some guys who are pushing themselves, you know, we're trying to to open up Ironman, open up triathlon. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of taken on this sort of elitist mentality. We're trying to break down some of those barriers and, and just get people to understand that it's really all about challenging yourself on an individual level and being able to connect with uh, the right guys to to, uh, to push you to build that community, build that tribe. And uh, so we're going to do some in-person retreats as well uh, over the, I guess that would be early 2023. So that's kind of uh, where we're at. If, you, if you're interested in any of those things, uh, my direct messages on Twitter are, are always open. I'm at Chris Betcher 9 And, uh, yeah, i uh, just looking forward to the next few months. It's, it's every day I'm kind of just taking it one day at a time and uh, allowing God to, to work and, close doors when he needs to and uh, open the doors and, and he never seems to let me down. That's awesome. Thanks, Chris, for being on. I really appreciate it, man. And, and I'm, I'm definitely uh, a huge fan of what you're doing and, and want to help you in any way possible. And I think anyone that can connect with you is, is going to level up their game for sure. So, so thank you. And, and thank you for just the help that you've been for me just personally in, in these last few months. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, I, I'm so thankful for, you know, our ability to connect uh, over the last few months uh, your encouragement, and I'm, I'm excited to to see you guys, you know, rock and roll here next week. I'm going to have a hard time uh, keeping up with all you guys on that Iron Man. One thing they need to do is update that app because that thing is awful when it comes to tracking <laughs> athletes. So uh, we'll, we'll see if I can crash my my phone a few times trying to uh, figure out how to keep an eye on all you guys on the course. That's great. Cool. Well, thanks, Chris. Yeah, brother. I, uh, I appreciate it, and uh, really thankful to uh, be on. Thank you for listening to the Two Cent Dad podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with another dad who you think would benefit. That's really the best thing you can do to help this show. It A, gets the word out, but B, and most importantly, it helps another father be better at his role as a father. And that's what this show, that's what this podcast, that's what the website, that's what the blog, everything exists for. 
So if you could, share it with another dad who would find value in it. You can always head over to the website, twocentdad.com, the number twocentdad.com. And if you have any feedback, feel free to email me, mike at twocentdad.com. I must also thank the sponsor, EC Group. If you're looking to hire software developers or you need extra development capacity, check out teamwithec.com. Thanks.